Hi, everybody. Welcome to lecture 20 in our series on the trivium. That is the first three of the classical liberal arts, grammar, rhetoric, and logic. This is the final installment in this series. We've looked at grammar and rhetoric and mostly logic in this series. Uh, we've also focused mostly on deductive arguments, whether those are categorical or, as we saw in the last letter uh, lecture, hypothetical. In this lecture, I want to wrap up by looking at induction, inductive arguments, and we'll get to review a bit the distinction presented in an earlier lecture between those two very different kinds of reasoning, deductive and inductive reasoning. Uh, so on, on our slide here, I, I googled induction, and I came up with the following uh, image. Um, Daisy is a swan and is white. Danny is a swan and is white. Dante is a swan and is white. Okay, great. Um, therefore, all swans are white. What we're going to do in this lecture is look at this style of argument, because this is actually far, uh, well, in a way, it's more common uh, than deductive argumentation. Uh, we draw lots of conclusions about the world around us, uh, vitally, very importantly, based on induction. Um, and induction and deduction uh, are both necessary to each other, uh, but also there's been a great emphasis on induction in recent um, centuries uh, as the natural scientific uh, revolution took root and has, uh, has so uh, dramatically played out. Okay, so what is induction? Why do we use it? My claim's going to be that you got to use induction and you got to use deduction. You got to use both of these things together in order to really practice logic. Uh, so uh, the conclusion here, therefore Socrates is mortal, and we've seen this a hundred times, I won't reread it, right, is uh, using a middle term and following the rules of uh, inference, and you get a valid argument. So if all men are mortal, and if Socrates is a man, then Socrates is mortal. Right? I'm drawing that conclusion by means of uh, deduction. Uh, however, the first two of these, all men are mortal and Socrates is a man, I get that by induction. I got to look at the world around me. Right. So all of the factors that are so prominently and importantly discussed today, and which we haven't said a lot about in the course, right? And bias and perspective and, and experience and things like this. This is going to play into our um, derivation of premises, right? Of the propositions that we're using as the basis for an argument. And that's going to be different from following the rules of inference to get a valid or a conclusion, or to get a true conclusion by valid deduction. Um, the argument here is going to be sound only if the premises are true. Remember, we had this discussion about validity and soundness. Uh, an argument is sound if its premises are true. So if it turns out that we, you know, are able to upload our consciousness into the cloud, then perhaps we would have to question the truth of the premise, all men are mortal. Um, where we find out Socrates was actually a god, and we might have to question the truth of our premise, Socrates is a man. Um, if in either case, if either of those premises proves to be false, then the conclusion, Socrates is mortal, would prove to be false. Even if we follow a perfectly you know, valid chain of inference to get to that conclusion. Now, um, not only are we um, forming those propositions by induction, but we're actually getting the very ideas that we're using, uh, the very concepts uh, from induction. So here we have um, a slide on the term mortal. Right? So that's one term in this categorical syllogism. Um, this is a universal concept. And here, as in all of our lectures, we're following the discussion of Hauser in his book Logic as a Liberal Art. Uh, you observe many living things. You note that all of those living things you see eventually die. And then you generalize from each of those particular observations, all of them taken together, and you get the universal concept of mortality. Where did we get our idea of mortality from? Well, it wasn't just implanted in our mind by a divine source, say, right? We opened our eyes, we looked around, we had an experience, and we eventually developed a concept um, to, to designate uh, that experience. Same thing here with the concept of man, or as we've uh, you know, emphasized, I hope, throughout these 
lectures, uh, meaning human being, this also is a universal concept. We meet lots of different human beings, just like we met lots of different swans on that title slide, um, and we get a notion of what a human being is. Now, that notion could be right. <laughs> well, this is very interesting, right? Um, you could, you can imagine a case where a person has a notion of human being that is very different from the notion many people have, and that could either be an insight on the part of that person, um, or it could be, um, we would want to say, uh, misunderstanding to some degree. Uh, and, and this is getting into other topics of philosophy that are very interesting, but go beyond um, the immediate theme of our course. In the third case here, <clears throat> we're looking at a particular concept, um, and this is an individual, Socrates. Right? And we're also getting this by means of induction. And there's more we could say here as well. Individuals are, um, as we've seen in some cases, uh, or actually in all cases, treated as universals, um, not just as particular instances, but they, but they are uh, particular uh, relative to men, uh, human being, and mortality here. Um, it is the minor premise of the syllogism. So we've got our terms, mortal, men, and Socrates, right? We're going to also use induction to put them together, as we referred to earlier, um, in a proposition. So you want to get the major premise, all men are mortal, and you want to get the minor premise, Socrates is a man. So these are judgments that we're making, not because we are judgmental, right? Or because we think we have the final truth, but because we are using our reason and uh, forming concepts based on our experience in the world, and then trying to put those concepts together into statements that reflect uh, truth. So once you have these concepts, and once you have the propositions, um, you can use deduction to place the particular concept, Socrates, under the universal concept, mortal, using the middle term, man. And this is deduction, right? So the middle term here is man or men. Um, and we're trying to get to the conclusion, which is therefore Socrates, subject, is, copula, mortal, predicate, right? We want to get that new piece of knowledge about the world. So Socrates, what did I do here, right? So I'm taking the term Socrates and mortal, and I'm putting them together into the conclusion, Socrates is mortal. And here, we, you know, we're just reviewing what we talked about in relation to the categorical syllogism. Yes, that's where it goes. All right. So how do we get these general concepts? Um, and how do we get these judgments about reality? Well, we got them by induction, right? And there are, um, as Hauser helpfully outlines, three kinds of induction. And we call these um, in uh, unapproachably multisyllabic form, uh, complete enumerative induction, partial enumerative induction and abstractive induction. So sorry for all those syllables, but I do believe that the concepts that these terms refer to are pretty straightforward. Let's take a look at <clears throat> the first of these, complete enumerative induction. Now, when I enumerate something, I count it, right? So enumerative is just an adjective meaning stuff you count. Uh, here, you enumerate or you count uh, every single example, and the two highlighted examples, which we'll look at in just a moment, um, you've got to count every one of these examples in order to make a, a sufficient induction, sufficient inductive um, uh, uh, drawing that conclusion or forming that, that judgment. Um, so in the case of here, what he's calling T1, we have the triangles she cut out of paper are white, right? So I'm referring to uh, a particular group of pieces of cut paper. And if I want to conclude that all of those are white, as affirmed in this proposition, I need to look at all of those pieces, a complete enumerative induction. I need to look at every one. What if she cut one that is red, right? And it's somehow off to the side. Well, I would be mistaken in concluding that they're all white unless I notice that red one, and then I can revise my judgment. In the case of W2 here, we have, there is water in those four buckets in the corner of the garage. Well, I can't just go and look in one bucket, right, and conclude with necessity, right, that they're in all four. I mean, we might do that. We might go to the garage, just check one bucket and be like, yep, looks like water, right, and then just kind of 
extrapolate, well, it must be in the other buckets too. Um, we're basing that on our experience that generally, if you know things are one way in one case, it might be the same way in other cases. But we would be making a weak argument in that case. We, we would not be um, performing induction in a good way. We really have to look at all four of those in order actually to conclude that all four of them contain water. Um, in this case, <clears throat> being cut from white paper, and this is the um, more technical language that Hauser offers to explain why these are examples of complete enumerative induction, being cut from white paper and being in four buckets in the garage are predicable accidents. Now remember, we had um, a, a lecture uh, a while back on predicables. Um, these are not essential to, respectively, triangles or water. Something can be a triangle even if she doesn't cut them out of paper. You know, something can be water even if it's not in one of those four buckets. Um, for this reason, because the propositions are talking about accidents in relation to the things that they're referring to, uh, we need to count every single example in order to draw a conclusion by means of induction. <clears throat> now, uh, uh, properly speaking, this is only barely a kind of reasoning, quite so, right? It's more a way of summarizing information in a convenient way. We're dealing with small numbers of things. I'm not really drawing conclusions. I, I'm just looking at what is there and making a statement that is justified based on the evidence. Uh, far more common than this, and the basis of like all of the sciences, natural and social, is partial enumerative induction. Um, in these examples, such as the highlighted uh, examples on the slide here, which we'll look at presently, um, you can't count all of them because you're not dealing with four buckets or six triangles. You're dealing with infinite, uncountable instances of a certain phenomenon. Um, in these cases, you cannot count every single example. It is just practically impossible. There are too many. So you count a sufficient number of examples, and then you generalize using induction. Hmm, okay, so the eyebrows are up. What is sufficient? Well, we determine that um, the same way we determine reasonableness uh, based on our social conventions and practices. Something that is considered sufficient or reasonable in one context or by one person may be considered insufficient or unreasonable by another. So now we're getting into the hurly-burly of, of inquiry. Um, so we have under T here, examples of partial enumerative induction, the three interior angles of a triangle are equal to two right angles. Okay, I, I got to actually look at it and make those measurements, but no way I'm measuring every single triangle ever. It's impossible, especially if you include p potential triangles. No, no way. A triangle is a three-sided plane figure. Um, I need to look at a triangle and see that, um, but again, I can't look at every triangle. Triangles do not make good wheels. I got to put one on a car and test it out, right? Um, I, again, can't do that in every case. In the case of water here, our W examples, water freezes at zero degrees centigrade, 32 Fahrenheit. Water is made up of H2O, and water cools you off after exercise in hot weather. Okay, in all of those cases too, I can't take every possible example where water would exhibit those properties, but I can look at a sufficient number of examples and draw that conclusion uh, pending further evidence to the contrary. Right? And that's, that is what makes science science, is an openness to new evidence uh, that is going to uh, challenge uh, the consensus that exists at present. Uh, question we've had here. Okay, so what is sufficient? We need to use our judgment and decide. This kind of reasoning is the foundation of all of the sciences, natural and social. Uh, and this is why the scientific community is important because this is many people exercising their judgment about what is going to be regarded as reliable, reasonable, sufficient in any given case. This is why in the early history of the natural sciences, it was customary for so many different people to attend um, medical experiments or other kinds of experiments because more people seeing it and seeing the same thing uh, serves to strengthen the finding of that experiment. Uh, sometimes, uh, and we'll distinguish now between the, these examples we've looked at, um, sometimes we use partial enumerative induction to identify a property of something. 
So we have the angles of the triangle, the fact they don't make good wheels, um, the freezing temperature of water, and the fact that water will cool you off. Okay, so these are properties. But other times, um, we use it to identify, and this is the distinction Hauser is making, um, the essence of something, as in these cases, right? Um, how do we know if something is a property of an object or its essence? We develop our insight, right? And this is where, at the end of his book and at the end of this series, we're coming to this interesting and contentious notion that there is such a thing as insight, and that insight can, in fact, yield um, uh, an understanding of what is essential to a certain thing and what is only uh, a property of it or even just accidental to it. But we'll say a bit more about that in a minute. And be interested to hear everybody's uh, thoughts about that. Before we get to that, though, so we've been talking about um, uh, enumerative induction, both complete and partial. Let's look at our third kind of induction, which we call abstractive induction. So when you abstract from something, you take uh, a kind of general idea of it based on particular examples. We use abstractive induction to form concepts. Uh, we move from our sense experience of particular examples, for example, Sarah, Isaiah, Kat, George, four different people, um, to a universal concept, as we saw in the earlier example, a human being, right? So I have experience of these four people. I'm like, oh, those are people. Those are human beings. Um, we do this, Hauser writes, through a capacity of our mind, and Hauser calls this intuitive intellectual insight, right? We're, we're able somehow to discern the universal concept, uh, which is above or which is a general, um, um, provides a general account of what these particulars are. This insight, um, Hauser contends, enables us to see an intrinsic and necessary connection between all of the examples. Um, and without getting into any controversial areas, we, we see this all the time. You can see six different kinds of apples, and you're able to tell the difference between an apple and a pear, or an apple and an orange. And in some cases, apples and pears, I mean, different different varieties of these things. It might be hard initially to you know, take a glance at it to tell the difference between the two, but you get a little closer and you look at it, and you're able to categorize those things. You have insight into what is an apple. You have insight into what is a pear. There will be, as it writes, many possible definitions of the concept human being, but there can only be one concept human being defined in different ways. And we discern this concept by insight. So here I would say Hauser is introducing uh, vitally the importance of perspective and of different points of view. Right? He's not denying that there are different perspective and different points of view. He's also not saying that he, Hauser, or any individual person has, by virtue of who they are, the perspective or the point of view. Um, he's saying only that our perspectives and points of view are not simply the end of the story. They are perspectives or points of view on something, as the very metaphor would suggest, right? I have a perspective on a certain object. And his contention is that when we use these general concepts, um, there is some truth about those concepts on which we have different perspectives, right? And the task of science, the task of reasoning, the task of civil society um, is to communicate with one another about our different perspectives and together seek a more perspicacious, if you want, a fuller understanding of what it is we are speaking about. Uh, using abstractive induction, um, as Hauser continues here in, in our capacity for insight, uh, we can derive, and here he's following closely Aristotle, four uh, axioms. And an axiom here is a proposition that we always and everywhere hold to be true. So these are things that are, uh, if something is axiomatic, it means I'm not going to question it in the course of this particular investigation. I'm going to take it as true. And each of these, inter inter uh, interestingly, has been questioned and challenged by later logicians. So I'm not saying that these are, you know, uh, burst, uh, burst full born from the mind of God, uh, but they are um, longstanding 
um, axioms in the practice of logic. And if a person wishes to challenge them, they need precisely to challenge them. Right? So, so these are things that most of us would take for granted in our everyday thinking. Um, they include the following, the principle of non-contradiction. Something cannot be both true, uh, and cannot both be, uh, be and not be true of a subject at the same time, in the same place, uh, in the same respect. Right? So I cannot say that I am a human being and I am a dog right here, right now, in the same place, time, respect. Um, this is one of the conditions of what we would uh, still today call clear thinking. You can't hold two things about one thing at the same time. You can maybe do that in a kind of poetic register. You can bring out a kind of deeper truth. I mean, we have lectures on this course about Christian mysticism. There, there are lots of ways you can um, relate to that. But in terms of um, logic, uh, the principle of non-contradiction um, obtains. The law of the excluded middle uh, from Aristotle. This is his second key uh, axiom, an attribute either is or is not true of a subject. There is no middle ground between is and is not, either true or false. And we've taken that for granted throughout the course. It's either true or it's false. It's not half true or half false, right? Um, that also has been interestingly challenged by logicians, um, but it forms the basis for a lot of our everyday thinking, as I've said. The last two um, don't have fancy names, uh, but they are also important, and they do also derive from Aristotle. Things which are equal to the same thing are equal to each other. So if I say that A is the same as B, and B is the same as C, then I can say A is the same as C. That's a kind of basic rule of, of logic, of inference in this case. And finally, the whole is greater than the part. You could have an interesting discussion, I'm sure, about what greater than means there, but simply if I have a large, if I have a cake and I cut a piece of that cake, then the piece of cake will be lesser than, here just in terms of quantity, than the whole cake. So these four axiomatic propositions are things that Aristotle and um, all of us in, in most uh, cases will take for granted, and again, take as constituting clear thinking. So as Hauser um, emphasizes here, both partial enumerative induction, and that's just when we uh, derive a general conclusion from a few examples, as we saw discussed above, and abstractive induction uh, reason from particular examples to universal conclusions, but there are some differences between them. So now we're comparing the latter two kinds, the most common kinds of induction that we've discussed. Abstractive induction is about finding the meaning of terms. This might be fairly easy and be done intuitively. It also might be difficult and be controversial, uh, but in any case, it is um, about finding the meaning of a term. What does it uh, I, uh, correspond to? I read a lot of Richard Rorty, so of course it's hard to use that term without smiling a bit. Uh, Richard Rorty is a philosopher, a pragmatist um, stream of thought who um, challenges the correspondence theory of truth, different different lecture, different time. Um, second here, um, partial enumerative deduction, so we're distinguishing this from abstractive. This is often harder. We need many examples, um, and we're not only in this case defining terms, but we're connecting a subject with certain predicates. We're saying all men are mortal. Have I met every human being? No. Have I met every mortal thing? No. All right, but I've met enough human beings or heard enough about human beings and never heard a counterexample uh, of a human being not dying. Yeah, I got my, got my grammar mixed up in that sentence, but maybe you got the idea. Uh, this predicate, as Hauser says, might be a predicable accident, so something that could be otherwise, or it could be an essential property. That is something connected with the subject intrinsically and necessarily. So I am sitting in this chair on the view we're presenting here is an accident. Right? I could not be sitting in this chair at this moment. I could stop the lecture and stand up. I would still be me. Um, but um, I am my height and weight and age at this particular moment in this time. Right? Um, that, I could say, is something that is uh, a property of myself. Um,
Our conclusion here is kind of what we started from, which is always nice when it works out that way. Hauser writes, induction and deduction work in harmony with each other, or they should. We need induction to arrive at many of the premises necessary for deduction, as we saw in the cases of all men are mortal and Socrates is a man. And we need deduction to lead us to new conclusions, which in turn lead us to search for more inductions, new propositions, which will further widen the scope of our knowledge. This is an ongoing process. Um, in induction, he also helpfully emphasizes, we must generalize beyond our database we cannot see every swan. We cannot see every human being. But in deductive reasoning, we never can generalize beyond our database. We need to be very strictly concerned with what we do know and what we don't know and not draw any conclusions um, based on uh, what we don't know, based on things about which we have no data. Some people um, are skeptical about induction, so that they question whether inductive arguments, either complete or partial, complete is kind of a special case, it's barely reasoning, as we said, but can partial enumerative induction actually give us reliable knowledge? Um, well, critics hold the following. Well, inductions are formally invalid. Um, if I just have met 10 people and I can make a conclusion, well, I'm basically drawing a universal from a particular. I'm basically making a universal conclusion based on only a few examples. Um, how can we know for sure that we've looked at enough examples? What is sufficient, right? Well, we can't necessarily know that. Um, and also we can make mistakes when we're using induction. Am I seeing things clearly? Is, is my bias clouding my vision? Whatever, um, and we can use bias there just in the sense, uh, Gadamer's sense of prejudice or assumptions that we're bringing to bear on any situation. Um, unlike the rules of deductive logic, observation is often not fully reliable. Um, at the same time, what else can we do? Uh, Karl Popper, the famous philosopher of science, has a brilliant line, um, I think, or read several lines, I guess, an example of the laws of science being like piles erected in a swamp. So a pile is when you're, you know, driving something down into the ground, right? Pile driver, for example. Um, well, not for example, that's how you do it with a pile driver. And then you build a house or structure or something on top of those piles, right? Do you know that your pile, your, you know, stake that you've driven down into the ground has hit bedrock, that it's, that it's sitting on the core of the earth? You don't know that. You can't know that. All you can know is that it's strong enough to accomplish your purpose. It's strong enough to hold the house, right? And so a consensus among scientists that a certain uh, inductive generalization is strong enough, right, is sufficient in terms of being based on a sufficient number of examples, um, that's kind of what the natural sciences are. We have here a last um, slide on this, to my mind, fascinating, and I expect somewhat controversial notion from Hauser, in intuitive intellectual insight. Um, just to read a couple of passages here from him. So he writes, uh, to know rather than just be of the opinion that all men are mortal requires us to have intuitive intellectual insight into the very nature or essence of the human animal. Such intellectual insight is different from the inductive reasoning process and from deductive reasoning. It caps off, so to speak, or completes the process of inductive reasoning generalization. Um, what we're talking about here really is the difference between knowledge and opinion. Is there a difference between knowledge and opinion? I feel like in our historical moment, there's a great deal of skepticism about claims to knowledge, um, but certainly there is a great deal of respect, happily, for a wide range of opinion, right? So Hauser's contention here that there is something, he's calling it insight, that can help us to uh, know when we have knowledge and when we merely have opinion um, is is interesting and something that I think it would bear uh, it would behoove all of us to to reflect upon and determine how we feel about it. So the highest form he continues of mental activity, the highest form of mental activity, is not reasoning, either inductive or deductive, but intellectual insight. 
the kind that happens when you've been struggling to see whether a concept is accurate or a proposition is true, and then all of a sudden you say what the great mathematician and physicist Archimedes said, Eureka, I have found it, right? That flash of insight, like when you get a joke or when you're, you know, looking at a, I don't know, optical illusion, you know, one of these, these duck rabbit kind of pictures and you say, ah, I see it now, right? That, that moment of recognition of something is, I take it, what he is referring to. Um, intuitive intellectual insight also is a concept with a lot of history, um, certainly in um, the philosophical tradition in the West. I'm thinking of um, Ralph Waldo Emerson, um, for whom I would, um, I believe this notion of insight was, was very important, this kind of flash, this revelation of a truth, uh, and then efforts to express that truth in language, um, some of which will exceed um, the reasoning that we've looked at in this course, uh, and in fact uh, require uh, poetry and art and other forms of expression. It has been a great pleasure walking with you through uh, this discussion of grammar, rhetoric, and logic, the first three of the classical liberal arts, um, based on Hauser's book, Logic as a Liberal Art, which I strongly recommend to you. Uh, thank you very much, and I hope you have found this uh, journey as edifying as I have.